Amen. Give a great big OVC and welcome to Susie Schellenberger. Thank you, Pastor Craig. It's so wonderful to be here with you this morning. Today's true action adventure story is lifted right from the pages of the Gospel of Mark, but it's one of those stories that has a choose your own ending type of ending. So how it ends up is your choice. Now, uh, we have a lot that's going on in this story. We're going to start out in a graveyard, and then we're going to head to a beach, and then we'll soar through the clouds, and we'll enter a castle. And again, where we end up is really your choice. Are you ready? Let's just go ahead and dive right into Scripture. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20 is where the story is encased. And we're going to put the Scriptures on the screen because I'm I'm reading from the Living Bible this morning. Here we go. When they arrived at the other side of the lake, a demon-possessed man ran out from a graveyard just as Jesus was approaching from the boat. In other words, before Jesus even had a chance to get his leg over the boat, I can see his robe is pulled up. I can see that his leg is in the air, but he's not even out of the boat yet. This man, who's despicable, vile, tormented, approaches Jesus. Do you know what that tells me? Jesus is approachable. He's a relational God. Anyone can approach Jesus. Don't ever think that you've gone too far or you've done something bad enough that will keep you from approaching Jesus. Anyone can approach Jesus. And this man, who was demon-possessed, approached Jesus. Now, he, he could feel something wasn't right. His flesh tingled. His hair stood on end. Sudden chills consumed his body. He could sense something. Something is definitely wrong. And then he felt it. The sudden disturbance of the supernatural occurrence inside of him. It was a demonic activity. They were bothered. They were maddened. Why? Because Jesus was approaching. You see, a demon's worst nightmare is to see Jesus approaching. But sure enough, right there in front of their eyes comes Jesus Christ right up to shore. He arrives in a boat. Let's read the next scripture. Verses 3 and 4, this man lived among the gravestones. In other words, he's making his home in the cemetery. He had such strength that whenever he was put into handcuffs and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the handcuffs from his wrists and smashed the shackles and walked away. No one was strong enough to control him. And so because of the satanic power within him, whenever he was bound with ropes, he just snapped them like dental floss. The same thing happened when he was chained in shackles. He, they were easily broken. Let's look at the fifth verse. All day long and all through the night, he would wander among the tombs. Again, he is actually living here in this cemetery. And he would roam in the wild hills screaming. That tells us he's miserable. And cutting himself with sharp pieces of stone. Now we get some more information from Luke's version of the story that we're going to blend in here. In Luke, we find out that this man is destitute and he's naked and he has literally nothing. He's living in a cemetery. What does this say about him. It says he's having a major identity crisis. It's saying, this is, is, is where I belong. This is who I identify with, people of the dead. I, I'm not even worthy enough to be around people that breathe and live. This is where I belong. You've got to be pretty desperate to feel that you belong in a gravestone and among the dead. He's experiencing extreme loneliness and massive aloneness. Two different things, aloneness and loneliness, but he is desperate. Satan has control of this man's life, and he's slowly just draining the life out of this man's pitiful, horrible condition. How did he become like this? We don't know. We're not told. It could be that back when he was in middle school, maybe he was bullied incessantly. It could be that at a young age, his parents divorced. Or it could be he was abused as a little boy. It could be he had experienced the death of a loved one. All of us experience hurt. And when we don't give that hurt to God, it festers and it boils and it grows and it begins to be a little black cloud that hovers over us and sooner or later will begin to define us. 
if we don't give that hurt to Jesus, Satan has an opportunity to grab a foothold, a little bit of control of our lives, and more control, and more control, and that's exactly what had happened. Satan had great control, total control, complete control of this man's life. Let's look at verse six. When Jesus was still far out on the water, the man had seen him and had run to meet him and fell down before him. Again, you can approach Jesus. Uh, This is kind of the same as verse 1, isn't it? But yet it's a little bit different perspective. Verse 1, Jesus is pulling up to shore. And in this verse, Jesus is still far out on the water. But the man sees him, he runs toward him, and he falls down before Jesus. Again, let me repeat, you are never too far gone to approach Jesus. Anyone can approach him. Verses 7 and 8. Then Jesus spoke to the demon within the man and said, come out, you evil spirit. It gave a terrible scream, shrieking, what are you going to do to me, Jesus? Son of God, for God's sake, don't torture me. You see, the demons are controlling the man's tongue and his voice, and they're speaking through him directly to Jesus Christ. In verse nine, what is your name, Jesus asked. And the demon replied, Legion, for there are many of us here within this man. Now Jesus knows all. He knew this man's name, but again, he's a relational God. And he always invites dialogue. Do you know that Jesus loves it when you dialogue with him? We talked about the power of prayer yesterday afternoon in our time together. Jesus loves your prayers. Oh, how he loves to hear the prayers of his children. In fact, we're told in Revelation, he loves your prayers so much that he keeps them. He saves them. He doesn't just answer them and toss them aside. He keeps them in a bowl. And your name is on that bowl. Every prayer you've ever prayed, your lifetime is in that bowl. Every prayer you will ever pray will be in that bowl. And so Jesus is inviting dialogue again because he's a relational God. And he wants to dialogue with this man named Legion. Now, Legion, that's a weird name, isn't it? It's a weird name for anyone. In those days, the word Legion meant 6,000 soldiers. Well, so was this man uh, really uh, possessed by 6,000 demons? Uh, Well, could be. Most Bible scholars believe that Satan, again, had such total control of this man that so many demons were inside of him, even Satan had lost count. The issue here is not really that he was called Legion. The issue is that Satan had robbed him of his name and replaced it with a label, Legion. Unfortunately, many of us, have allowed Satan to slap a label onto us as well. You're the divorced one. You're the one who struggles with alcohol. You're the one who has the gambling habit. You're the one who lies. You're the one who's... No, Jesus doesn't see you by a label. He calls you by your name, always. How do you know, Susie? Because Isaiah 43, 44, and 45 continue to repeat, you are mine, you are my chosen one. Oh, you are so special. I call you by your name. And so Jesus is inviting dialogue with him, and he wants to call you by your name as well. In verse 15, as we continue on, um, we see that that the the demons try to strike up a deal with Jesus. They know who Jesus is, and they know the end of the story. They know that eventually they're on the losing team. And so they try to strike up a deal with Jesus. Don't send us to the bottomless pit. Please, please, we don't want to go there. Oh, there's a herd of pigs over there. Please, just send us into the pigs. You see, a human is always Satan's first choice. But if a human isn't available, he'll take an animal. And so Jesus sent all the demons. He cast them into this giant herd of pigs. Maybe you know the story. They went squealing down a slippery mountain slope into the lake and they drowned, or they committed suicide. Anyway, all the the pigs drowned. Jesus doesn't make deals. We can't cut a deal with Jesus Christ, can we? Now let's go to verse 15. And a large crowd soon gathered where Jesus was, but as they saw the man sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane, they were frightened. You see, no one had been able to help this guy before. I mean, they didn't want it, anything to do with him. We don't know how to deal with him. We don't want to deal with him. Just send him away. But now Jesus has healed him. 
Jesus has brought complete restoration to his life. He's whole, he's fully clothed, he's a new person. Guess what, Jesus wants to do the same with us. He wants to do the same with you. He wants to bring complete restoration to you. He wants wholeness for you. Wants to bring you into completion with him. That's what Jesus wants to do for you. And this man was so grateful that when Jesus got in the boat to leave, the man said, ha, wait, wait, wait a minute, I, I wanna go with you. Jesus, now that you've changed me and I've placed my faith in you, I wanna get in the boat and go with you. And Jesus said, no. What? Jesus, why would you say no? Jesus says in verse 19, go home. Go to your friends, Jesus told him, and tell them what wonderful things God has done for you and how merciful he's been. In other words, I have a ministry for you. I want to involve you in ministry. Oh, there's so much that I want to do in you and through you more than you can comprehend. That's what Jesus says to us today. I have a ministry for you. I want to use you to bring glory to my name and to help build my kingdom and the greatest mission field is right here in our own home, our own family, our own community, our own campus, our own place of work. Right here, Jesus says, go home. Go to your greatest mission field. That's where I want to do a ministry in you and through you. Now there may be a time when God does call us to foreign missions, but the greatest mission field is right here, right now in our own, in our own home. Now before we go on, I wanna bring your attention to something that's not said, but it's written all between the lines of scripture. Jesus got in the boat to leave, and he told the man, no. Okay, Jesus came across the lake, he met Legion, he healed him, brought wholeness to him, restored him, got back in the boat, and crossed the lake. Do you know, the only reason Jesus crossed an entire lake was to bring wholeness to this tormented man. Wow, you serve a God who is willing to cross an entire lake to get to you. He'll cross a lake, an ocean, a sea, a river. He's willing to pretty much move heaven and earth to send his own son (laughs) just for you. What a God. Wow, what a God that we serve. Well, Susie, uh, that's a miracle. Yes, it is a miracle. Jesus was saying to the man, instead of coming with me in the boat, I want you to stay here. In other words, he was saying, get out of the graveyard and go home. I want you to stay here in the city with your family and your friends and in your workplace. No, don't come with me in the boat. Stay here in your city, but get out of the graveyard. That's what Jesus is saying to us this morning. Get out of the graveyard. I have a ministry for you, and I want to involve you in in ministering, helping others, and I want to transform you and minister and work through you. Get out of the graveyard. Well... I'm a Christian, Susie. Why would I be in a grave? Why would Jesus tell me to get out of a graveyard? Many of us Christians are living inside of a graveyard. But we've become so comfortable with it, we've failed to realize where we are. And we've kind of gotten so used to living among tombstones labeled with carnality and sins of the flesh, deceit, gossip, lying, uh, unforgiveness, bitterness, pornography, addiction, alcoholism, We've just gotten so comfortable living among these tombstones. Jesus has forgiven my sins. Yes. Then why are you living in a graveyard? Look around you. Jesus isn't to be found among the dead, the angel said on Easter morning. Jesus isn't among the dead. He's among the living. But many of us Christians have become so accustomed with our shackles that we've begun to accessorize them. We've accepted them as part of our wardrobe. And Jesus is saying this morning, get out of the graveyard. You weren't meant to live among the dead. You weren't meant to live among carnality. Let me guide you out of the graveyard. You were meant for more, Susie. It would take a miracle. I mean, it certainly was a miracle what he did for Legion, but it would take a miracle to get me out of some of these habits, of some of these attitudes. I mean, you just don't understand the abuse that I suffered. You don't understand. He had no right. She shouldn't have done that. I know I don't understand because I haven't walked in your shoes, but God understands. And he wants to free you from the shackles, and he wants to lead you right out of the graveyard. Again, 
it would take a miracle, Susie. And though I understand that Legion experienced a miracle, that was in the Bible. I'm not so sure miracles are happening today. The same God who did miracles in the Old Testament is the same God who did miracles in the New Testament, and he's the same God who's doing miracles on Sunday, February 14th, at Oral Valley Church of the Nazarene. <gasps> seriously? Seriously. He's the same God. He's in the same miracle business. Maybe some of you know uh, that for the past 17 years, I've taken two-week international mission trips. I take a lot of students, and, and I take a lot of adults who love students and want to help me out. And um, we go to a different Central or South American country each summer. This summer, we'll be going to Haiti for two weeks. There are still over 300,000 orphans in Haiti. I need your help. If you'd love to come with me, I'd love to use you for two weeks, and you can meet me out at the book table, and I can get you all the information. But a few years ago, uh, we were right outside of Guatemala City. We present the gospel uh, through a, a pantomime drama that's set to Spanish narration and Spanish music. And one of our students said to the translator uh, after the drama was over, you see that elderly man way up there on the veranda about a half a block away? I don't know if he was able to hear or understand, so let's go to him and ask him, and then we can share the gospel with him if he wasn't able to hear. So they made their way up there to the veranda and it didn't take them long to realize no he hadn't heard because he was deaf. And so through sign language they're asking can we pray for you? Yes, yes we can pray for you. And our student uh, Charlotte and the translator uh, placed their hands on the man's ears and just began to pray. And Charlotte that student prayed such a passionate fervent prayer oh, dear God how is he ever going to know that he needs to confess his sins and that, that you sent Jesus to die for his sins and that, that you conquered death and that you're in heaven and you want to live in his heart and that he has to have his sins forgiven to get into heaven? And How will he ever know if he can't hear the gospel? Lord, I don't know how, but some way, somehow, help him to sense it. Help him to sense that's what he needs, Lord. I don't know how, but just do something. And she said, Susie, I felt, I felt a warmth in my hand that I've never felt before. It was like a power surge in my hand and she said after we said amen he looked at us and he said I heard every word that you said he said I am 90 years old when I was 50 I began losing my hearing and I went to the doctor and he said yes you're losing it and you're going deaf in about a year you will have complete hearing loss and he said for 40 years I haven't heard anything but I want you to know I heard every word of your prayer and so I have just prayed while you've been praying with me, I've been praying that the Lord would forgive my sins and come into my heart, and I believe he has. And I believe I'm a Christ follower now. Praise his name. God is still in the miracle business. Another summer, just a few years ago, we were on the outskirts of Lima, Peru, in the poorest of the poor section. People were living in cardboard boxes at best. Maybe you could call it a cardboard box. And there was, in this poorest of the poor section, they didn't have water. They didn't have running water. Twice a week, they would pay, and the government would bring in big barrels of water. And so when your water is limited, of course, you have to make some fast choices. Do I bathe with the water, cook with the water, drink with the water, clean with the water, do laundry with the water? You can't do all of that. You can only do one or two things because your water supply is so limited. Limited. And so when we showed up, I said, hey, let's just pay to bring extra water in. We'll have a water day. Each day, every team can have a different water day with the villagers, and we'll do whatever they want us to do with extra water. We'll bathe their kids. We'll do their laundry. We'll just give it to them if they just want to do whatever. But we are here to be the hands and feet of Jesus with water. And so we found out that their children, and there were a lot of children in this village, had never had their hair shampooed. Of course, they'd never heard of shampoo, and when water is limited, why would you wash your hair, especially if you're a child? And so they they said, that's what we would like to do with the water. And so our kids had already brought little shampoo bottles from hotels. And every day, they'd go and line up a different group of kids, just you know, a few hundred kids every day from a different portion of the village. And it was our very last ministry day. And this te team eight came. And they had the kids lined up as far as they could see. And when they were down to about 10 more kids who needed to have their hair shampooed, the translator turned to Jessica and said, well, you need to stop. Just call it off right now. Why? Why? We still have 10 kids' hair to shampoo. Well, look at your water. Jessica looked down and she only had about a half a cup of water left in the bucket. Now how they would shampoo the hair is just dab a, a thing of shampoo and then pour a cup of water on it, rinse their head, and then another cup of water that would rinse off all the shampoo. And she said, but we can't. We can't. They won't understand this. You have to. You don't have enough water. You're going to have to. We can't. They won't understand. And this is a message from God. It's a ministry. It's our testimony. You're going to have to shut the line down. She said, we won't. 
And she said, let's just pray. God, we don't know how, but we need to shampoo these kids' hair, and so we're just gonna trust you. And then she said, we're not even gonna look at the water. The next kid came up, dabbed the shampoo, water on, water off, shampoo, next kid, water on, water off. Only when they had shampooed the last child's head did they dare to look down and see still one half a cup of water left in their bucket. God is a God of miracles, and he's still doing miracles today. And he wants to do a miracle in your lives. He wants to do a miracle in our church body. He wants to give you a ministry, and he wants to minister through you. But first, he wants to lead you out of the graveyard. God is not among the dead. He is among the living. And he doesn't do miracles in graveyards. He wants you to embrace kingdom living, life in the fullness of his Holy Spirit. Now, to illustrate this story, I want to take you back to when you were about five or six years of age, okay? A familiar children's story to illustrate this point, that God wants you to embrace kingdom living. There was a widow and her son, Jack. They were destitute. They only lived in a small one-room house. It was kind of a shack, and they only had one material possession besides their shack. Uh, they had a cow, and the mom told Jack, take the cow to the market and sell it, and the money that you will use, we will use to live on. The money you will get from the cow, we'll use to live on for as long as we can, and, well, I guess then we'll die. It reminds me of a story found in the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 17. It's the widow at Zarephath, and she's preparing her last meal. She's already told her son, I'll bake this bread with the little flour and oil that we have, and after we eat it and drink this little bit of water we have, well, son we will die. But the prophet Elisha arrived and he said, <laughs> I'm a prophet of God and your water will not run out, your oil will not run out, and your flour will never be used up. And again, she was able to make plenty. You serve a God of miracles, but he doesn't do miracles in a graveyard. And so Jack takes the cow and he leads him on the way to market. But on the way to market, he stopped by a man who says, Jack, don't sell the cow for money. How long is your money gonna last? It's gonna run out pretty fast. Instead, give me the cow and I'll give you these special beans that I have. Now you can live a long time on beans. The beans will grow and reproduce and reproduce and you can have beans for a long time. And Jack, there's something special about these beans. When you plant them tonight, by the next morning, you'll know what's so special about it. Well, mom was pretty disappointed. Jack sold the, the cow for beans, but Jack planted them. And sure enough, the next morning, as you know the story, there was a giant bean stalk that just soared. I mean, it pierced right through the clouds. Jack climbed up the bean stalk, fell over onto the clouds, and then he noticed kind of a grassy meadow nestled in between the clouds, and a mansion, well, a castle really, was in the close distance, and he noticed an elderly woman approaching him. So he said, ma'am, is that your castle? And she said, no, but I can tell you the story of that castle. Once a noble knight lived in that castle with his children and his wife. And his, his wife took the youngest son, and they were away visiting friends. And, and while that was happening, an evil giant came into the castle, and he took over, and he t uh, sent the man away, and, and he had him disposed of, and he sent the children away, and he claimed the castle as his own. Now I'm going to tell you who that son was and who the mother was. She said, the son is you. And the mother is your mother. And you must take back and claim the castle for yourself because you really own the castle. What? Jack was shocked. You, you mean that castle and everything in it is ours? All Jack had known all of his life was poverty. How many times had he gone to bed with his stomach still growling, wondering, will we have anything for breakfast in the next morning? Oh my goodness. And so the elderly lady said to Jack, Jack, you must take it back from the giant for you and your mother to own. And do you have the courage to fight the giant? And Jack said, well, I must have the courage. I must have the courage to do what's right. Second, uh, Second Timothy 1, 6 and 7. I want you to stir into flame the strength and boldness that is within you. For the spirit that God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power. Okay, good. Now to defeat the giant, this is what you have to do. You must enter the castle and take the hen that lays the golden eggs and take the harp that speaks. And you're not stealing. Remember, everything in the castle belongs to you. Suddenly the woman vanished and Jack thought, oh, she must have been an angel. Jack ran to the castle and he ran rang the bell and the wife of the giant answered 
my husband the giant hates children. He will eat you. Hmm, who hates you and wants to rob you of everything that God wants to give you? Who wants to destroy you? Satan. Just then, Jack heard the loud thump, thump, thumping of the giant coming up the stairways, and so he slipped inside the castle, and he hid inside of a closet. And when the giant entered the castle with his amazing grasp of the English language, he began to shout, fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of an Englishman. In other words, something's not right, and I can smell the difference. I can feel the difference. I can see the difference. I hear the difference. Something's not right. We have made this castle a home of darkness, but I see that the light has been here. Well, yeah, light and darkness don't mix. I mean, darkness can't ever hide the light. And midnight darkness times a bazillion cannot hide even a minuscule trace of God's light. And the giant noticed. Satan always knows when he's trespassing on God's property. The giant was furious. His wife tried to calm him down. Sit down, I'll bring you your supper. The giant sits down and he begins to eat his supper and the little hen comes over and lays a golden egg at the giant's feet. The giant falls asleep. Jack, seeing his opportunity, opens the closet door, slips out, grabs the hen and the golden egg and on his way out to shimmy down the beanstalk, he sees a bag of golden coins and he remembers what the angel had said. Everything in the house, the castle, belongs to you. You're not stealing. So he grabbed the bag of golden coins too and he shimmied down the stalk and he showed his mom and she began to weep, Jack. I've never shared this story with anyone, but yes, it's true. The house, the castle does belong to us. Oh, this is wonderful. Now we can live comfortably. And Jack said, oh no, this isn't just all. Mom, we've got the whole castle. I mean, mom, as you know, the whole castle and everything in it belongs to us. So I'm going back tomorrow and I'm going to claim what belongs to us. Oh no, 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 don't do that, Jack. This is fine. This is enough. Don't settle for mediocrity in your relationship with Christ. Don't ever settle for less than the very best that God wants to give you. Well, you already went to church on Sunday morning. Do you really need to go to a Bible study too? Do you really need to be in an accountability type friendship, relationship? I mean, my goodness, do you really need Yes, I want all that God has to give me. And Jack says, I'm going back in the morning. And the next morning, he shimmied up the, the beanstalk and he crept inside the castle again and waited inside the closet. And soon the familiar thump, 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 thumping of the giant came up the stairs. And again, he enters the castle and he opens and he says, fee fi fo thumb. And Jack's thinking, oh, please. It's been 24 hours. You can't come up with a better line than fee fi fo. Those aren't even words. You got a couple of consonants and a vowel thrown in the middle. That's not even a word. The giant is furious. And again, his wife tries to appease him, said, ah, I'll bring you your supper. He sits down and she brings his supper, but he's still furious. He still can't settle his mind. And so his wife brings out the harp, the talking harp, to soothe his mind until he finally falls asleep. Who do we know in the Old Testament whose mind was often maddened and disturbed and he would call for a shepherd boy. Oh yes, it was King Saul, wasn't it? And he would call for David to come in and play his harp until his mind was soothed and he could go to sleep. So when the giant falls asleep, Jack seizes his opportunity and he slips out of the closet door and he grabs the harp that speaks and he begins to dash toward the door but the harp begins speaking. Master, wake up, I'm being stolen. Jack turns to the harp and he says, no you're not, you belong to me. And he quickly tells him the story. My dad, he's the, my father, he's the noble knight that owns this castle. Everything in it belongs to me. I'm Jack, my father is the owner, I am his son. And when the harp learned to whom it belonged, he relaxed and felt secure in the safe grip of his master, Jack. Remember whose you are. Remember to whom you belong. Because Satan is working overtime, trying to deceive you and make you believe you belong to the world. You belong to alcohol. You belong to bitterness. You belong to an unforgiving spirit. You belong to pornography. You belong to greed. You belong to lying. You belong to, to pornography. You belong to, no, no, no. 
Remember who you are. You're a child of the king. Your father owns the castle. And so Jack grabs the harp and they're starting out the door when the giant wakes up and he is furious and he begins screaming, I'll kill you, I'll kill you. Jack had finally had enough. So he turned to the giant and he speaks to him in his own language. Fee, fi, fo, fum. I've been washed in the blood of God's own son. My daddy is the king of the castle. Guess what? He's coming back for me someday. And when he does, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. I'm in his tribe. I'm his people and everything he owns, he shares freely with me. That mansion on the hilltop, it's mine. This castle belongs to me. Check the mailbox. It's my name on the box. Everything he has is mine. My friends, you are children of the king and everything he has belongs to you because he freely gives it to you so everything he had, that means uh, the fruit of kindness good take that the power of the holy spirit good that's yours too oh my goodness redemption that's yours eternal life enjoy it feasting with the father you better believe it victory yes that's yours too salvation and strength to overcome that belongs to you and and authority over Satan and the demons, that's yours. Joy, yes, wholeness, love it, boldness, live it, confidence, embrace it, peace, wallow in it. Everything that the Father has belongs to you. So why would you choose to remain in a graveyard when kingdom life, kingdom living, is yours for the asking? That's the end of the story. Well, how do we end? That's up to you because you choose your own ending. I'm comfortable here in the graveyard. I know it's not God's ideal place for me. I, okay, I understand. Yes, I can have more. I can live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, I can have everything he has to offer, but I don't know if I can get out of these shackles. I don't know if I can get rid of that habit. Can I ever really have victory over? And I've become so accustomed to, you serve a God of miracles. And he wants to empower you with his very self, his spirit, releasing supernatural power into every, every area of your life. But that doesn't happen among the dead. Jesus is not to be found in a graveyard. He's not among the dead. He's in the living. And he invites you to be a part of kingdom, living through the power of his Holy Spirit. He wants to give you a ministry. He wants to do in you and through you more than you can imagine. Don't settle for less. What I have is good. This is all that I need. No. He wants to give you the kingdom. So how do we close? How about bowing your heads and let's pray together. Have you been living in a graveyard? I've become so accustomed to Susie, I've become so accustomed. I, I've gotten comfortable with these shackles. It would take a miracle. God's in the miracle business. And he would love to remove the shackles from you right here, right now. So would you just ask him right now, Jesus, would you lead me out of the graveyard? To be honest, I'm tired of living among these tombstones that are bragging of sins of the flesh. Deceit, carnality, greed. Oh, Lord, oh, I could go on and on. I'm tired of all that. And through the power of your Holy Spirit, I want kingdom life, Jesus. I want all that you have to give me. If you want to give me victory and power and joy and wholeness and kindness and love and gentleness and freedom, oh, oh, oh I want it. And Jesus, I want to be a part of a ministry. I don't want to just sit on the sidelines. So would you do in me and through me more than I can comprehend? Jesus, that's the ending to the story I'm choosing this morning. I embrace kingdom life through the power of your Holy Spirit. So do in me what needs to be done. Because Jesus, this morning on Valentine's Day, September February, I mean Sunday, February 14th, I surrender all. Would you say that to him silently? I surrender all. And would you leave the graveyard? Would you ask God for the ministry that he wants to do in you? And would you embrace through the power of his Holy Spirit, kingdom living?